So welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our ethics seminar series. Um, I'm John, the seminar coordinator, and um, Miss Cassandra Medley um, is with me, and and we will be the moderator uh, through the seminar. Today we have uh, three speakers, and they will be giving a very interesting talk about the COVID-19 and uh, its connection with the climate. So just a few things before we start up. Um, the seminar, just so you know, the seminar is being recorded, um, and we will put the recording on ASIC YouTube channel. Uh, today's agenda is end. Um, we will first um, let the speaker do their presentation, and then we will have uh, the attendees uh, to bring up their questions. You can ask the for the attendees. You can ask a vocal question. Uh, just click on the raise hand button, and we will unmute you. You can also withdraw your request by clicking the lower hand button. You can also send a text message to Miss uh, Cassandra Medley, and she will be forwarding the questions to the speakers. And so. Okay, um, I think uh, let me first give a brief introduction about the speaker before they start. So Muhammad is an associate professor of medicine and infectious diseases at the Institute of Human Virology and UMD School of Medicine. He's also a member of Global Virus Network. And Flando is a hydrologist and water resource engineer and conducts research on water sustainability and climate. He's a professor now at UMD and is also our interim director at ASIC. Augustin is an assistant research scientist at ASIC. His main research interest focuses on understanding the physics and predictability of large scale and atmospheric modes of variability and applying this knowledge in developing applications with uh, social economic benefits. And so I think I will give the ball to Fernando first. Get it, please. Uh, wonderful. Thank you, John, for uh, for the introduction and welcome everybody. Um, and um, and uh, yes, hopefully we'll be able to cover uh, our work um, and answer questions. Um, and um, so, so this um, um, this research uh, started in a very interesting way, at least to me. Um, um, it was a uh, it was a Friday evening. I think it was March six, and I, I I'm I'm at home, and I get um, I get this call on my phone. There's someone calling me, and it says uh, University of Maryland. But it was like seven p.m. on a Friday, so I said I'll I'll you know I'll I'll do this next week, not knowing who it was. Um, um, and then, you know, probably in 50 minutes after that, I, I got a, an email um, from um, from Mohammed, from Mo Sajadi, um, uh, detailing what he wanted to talk to me about. So, so Mo was looking, um, if I recall, and he, and he, he can correct me <laughs> uh, later on. He was looking at how uh, um, at the at the outbreaks of COVID-19 in, in Wuhan. And then later in Italy and Spain, which at the time were sort of the first three hotspots, and um, and he was noticing that these uh, three outbreaks were in a very tight latitude band, right? And um, and he wanted to um, you know talk to uh, folks that did uh, research in weather and climate uh, to see if we can correlate uh, you know the those out the occurrences of those outbreaks with uh, with the you know the range of temperatures and possibly range of humidities, because his expertise um, in virology told it you know we were trying to test the hypothesis of whether COVID nineteen was a seasonal virus you know like influenza and others um, and uh, so I, I I looked uh, you know I, and so so I got the email and then I I didn't I don't think I responded quite immediately but I started looking at the data and re I realized very quickly that I needed some uh, some other expertise and. So the other person I know works a lot with temperature data. They I said this Augustine because he's been doing these uh, global uh, um, heat wave analysis um, that I know of. So I, I so I contacted Augustine the next day on a Saturday, and then we I think the three of us worked furiously through um, that weekend to uh, 
you know, uh, get get some some data analyzed. And you know, we, we thought we were onto something. And since then, and 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 Mo and Augustine will tell you a little bit more about how we actually went about that work. But we started looking at the um, at how the disease, uh, the virus, was progressing around the world. At the the dates of the first outbreak, and you know, the number of people infected, and and looking at the temperature and humidity data um, in those locations. Um, and uh, you know, questions as interesting as, for example, why did not, why didn't the virus go south in China when it went to Wuhan, and rather actually moved, um, you know, and moved uh, at the same latitude band, uh, you know, westward. Uh, so, so that's sort of what got us thinking. And um, so, long story short, we did this analysis. We 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 got a pre-public a, a, a paper um, posted on. Um, on the SRSN website, which is a like a, like a working paper type of of, of, a, of of approach, and then we actually got our paper submitted later on. It was just published in in one of the uh, journal of the American Medical Association JAMA uh, a journal. So um, I'll turn it over to Mo so he can uh, get into into some of the research, and Augustine also will tell you a little bit about the data analysis that we did. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Mo now. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Fernando. Um, and yeah, it was. A fr I remember that clearly. It was Friday evening, and we were, we didn't expect anyone to answer uh, that quickly because it was it was rather late. But we were very <laughs> glad. <laughs> and we took our call. And obviously, yeah, we're, I'm not a climate climate scientist, and um, a lot of these things uh, we needed uh, we needed uh, their expertise on. Um, but yeah, let me talk a little bit about uh, respiratory viruses, uh, seasonality, and and um, how how we're looking at this. Um, so most respiratory viruses uh, that infect humans actually have a seasonal pattern, and I've listed here some of the more common ones. So adenovirus, there's um, four known human coronaviruses. So these are coronaviruses that uh, are known to infect humans. Uh, a couple of them were discovered in the '60s and two actually about a decade ago after the SARS um, epidemic. And there's human metanumaviruses, there's influenza viruses that everyone's familiar with. There's parainfluenza viruses and RSV and rhinoviruses. So a lot of these have um, seasonal patterns. And, and especially, what, what do we mean by that? So in temperate areas, including where we're in right now, which is Maryland, um, they typically have a peaks in, in the fall and winters. Um, and then in the tropics and the subtropics, uh, these same viruses actually can be found year round and they can have peaks, uh, one or more peaks occurring. So, uh, for example, in India, there's uh, peaks typically occurring during the monsoon season. Uh, and uh, in subtropical areas like Brazil, too, you have peaks um, that occur during their coolest um, uh, win winter months. Um, there's a lot that we don't understand about seasonality, especially in the tropics and subtropics. We have a little bit of a handle on temperate areas. Um, so there've been a lot of ideas, even in the temperate areas, uh, put forward to explain this. Um, but I think most of the laboratory evidence, uh, uh, the, the strongest evidence, I should say, it demonstrates that low humidity and temperature conditions uh, account for this. So you know, if you do experiments in a laboratory, um, with, uh, for example, guinea pigs, uh, they've shown that uh, low absolute uh, humidity and also low temperatures, you have increased uh, transmission. Um, that's not to say you, you can't have transmission in, uh, in any other way. So if you, if you separate the animals in cages, you get uh, transmission best in that way. But if you put them in the same cage, uh, you know, the temperature and humidity don't matter as much. You can still get transmission. Uh, so we were talking about aerosol transmission um, and for influenza in particular that's been shown. Also um, epidemiologically in the US uh, there's been studies showing that the timing of the epidemic um, when it first starts uh, is associated with uh, decrease, uh, decreasing uh, humidity and, and that occurs um, at different times in different states but it's actually we can actually time the beginning of the um, influenza epidemic. Um, so the way I think of seasonality, um, at least for flu and, and possibly some of the other viruses, is, is there could be uh, temperature and humidity conditions that aid in the transmission 
of these seasonal respiratory viruses. Now, what, what are the, some of the other things that factor into uh, transmission? Uh, in terms of seasonality, um, so uh, the different theories were uh, in the wintertime, you have uh, uh, people um, are spending more time indoors. Um, there's been data showing that um, certain uh, during the winter time, uh, uh, in the innate immune system uh, in, in the nasopharynx, so this is part of our immune system, uh, it doesn't uh, uh, is, is somewhat uh, defective uh, in, in the colder months. Uh, there's also some viruses actually replicate better uh, in the cold um, rather than in warm conditions. This is even in the human body, so they replicate better in the nose and say internal organs uh, just based on the temperature. Um, and uh, also, so the, you know, those are some of the um, other um, reasons why in, in, uh, in the cooler uh, climates, in the winter times, that uh, you could have um, transmission. But I think that the data really shows that um, maybe the main drivers in these areas are probably the climate, uh, climate conditions. Uh, things that we understand, like I said, and maybe there's some others that we still uh, don't completely understand. Okay, and Fernando uh, alluded to this. So, it, you know, some early modeling work um, out of uh, when this, uh, at that point was an epidemic that uh, began in Wuhan, showed that the areas that were at serious risk were those that closest to China and that had a lot of trade and travel links. So this was uh, areas like Bangkok, and that was the one area they thought was gonna be the next, um, right after uh, Wuhan in China. And that really didn't happen. And uh, really, the, the in in the next days and weeks and months, uh, you know, Southeast Asia was largely spared. Um, even uh, you know, Singapore, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, all these regions that bordered on uh, China uh, to the south really were spared. But we saw shifting of cases in Japan, in uh, South Korea, and then Iran and Italy. And when I saw this, it really made me think that, well, maybe there could be a, a seasonal component to this virus. And so we, we proposed this, um, that uh, based on the early spread, uh, that this virus uh, could be behaving as a seasonal respiratory virus. So we examined climate data from uh, cities um, that had significant community spread of COVID-19 and compared to them areas that either were not affected or did not have uh, significant, significant community spread. And we had defined this um, as greater than 10 uh, reported deaths in the country as of March 10th. And we really wanted to also look at uh, the time period before there were interventions. So obviously public health interventions can affect transmission. And we've seen that here, we've seen it around the world um, that it can lead to a decreasing uh, transmission of the virus. Um, and so it becomes very hard, for example, right now, if you try to tease out what's, what's going on uh, with the public health interventions, with uh, closing and reopening of, uh, of um, uh, basically the states, uh, I think it becomes very difficult to tease out all the different parameters, but we um, were looking at the early spread and uh, came to these, um, uh, we analyzed and came to the following conclusions. So um, what we did was we, we looked at a period of 20 to 30 days at, prior to the first community death. So the first um, community death would be uh, these lines here shown in um, red. And we're, we looked at a, a period of 20 to 30 days. And why did we pick that time period? Well, um, we, we based that based on what we knew about the virus at the time. So uh, we know that there's a five-day incubation period for the virus. Um, are not is, um, or the number of uh, infected persons um, that one person uh, can infect was around two. And uh, looking at the doubling time, we thought that uh, 20 to 30 days would capture um, what was going on uh, climate-wise in that particular locale um, at the beginning of, of community spread. So uh, during the next uh, 20 to 30 days, we would have a doubling of cases until we reached at least 50, um, which was the point where we thought we'd have at least one death. So uh, we didn't strictly look at cases. We wanted to look at deaths 
Um, we thought that was a little bit better measure of um, uh, what was going on in, in a particular location because with testing, with different testing availability, different testing and reporting practices, the number of cases really um, uh, has problems if you, if you just concentrate on that. You know, there's problems with looking at deaths as well, but uh, we thought between the two, that was a better one. And so, um, and so we looked at um, this period and really we were um, kind of surprised that um, at least when we looked at the average temperature, and specific humidity that the, the cities that were affected really had a, um, they clustered uh, in terms of uh, very tightly around, uh, around these uh, conditions. So based on that work, we put forward ranges, uh, five to 11 degrees Celsius average temperature and specific humidity of three to six uh, grams per kilogram. And this is looking at um, a temperature uh, data from November, 2018 to March, 2019, so one year, Prior, um, you guys are climate experts, so you know that these um, ISO lines they they do move, um, but not uh, significantly year to year. Um, but we chose uh, the last years uh, as probably the most um, um, I wouldn't say accurate, but uh, uh, it was the one we we thought would be uh, closest to what the ranges would be for the, for the for the current year, or the highest likelihood of that anyway. And you could see that the areas affected, which were Japan, South Korea, Wuhan, here, Iran, Italy, um, France, uh, Spain, and then also Seattle, all kind of fit, fit within uh, this temperature range um, that we had described. Um, so then we looked at the actual temperatures, uh, 2M temperatures in uh, January and February, so the two months, uh, month prior of, of 2020 in the same year. And um, uh, we looked at ERA-5 data and you, we could see something uh, very similar in terms of the temperature ranges. Um, and when we overlaid uh, humidity, we, we got something uh, very similar. Um, the humidity and the low temperature and low humidity, or absolute humidity, uh, kind of uh, run, uh, are, are highly correlated with each other. So um, much of the same areas were, had both low temperature and humidity. Uh, we took it, uh, okay, so this again uh, is a slide showing the clustering that we had talked about. Um, so what we're looking here, we uh, uh, plotted average temperature uh, for about 50 different cities with and without COVID and average specific humidity. And then uh, the red circles are the ones uh, that I just showed you before, uh, the affected cities as of, uh, it had significant community transmission as of March 10th. And you can see that they all clustered uh, tightly in this low temperature and humidity range. And then um, this shows you the number of cases in the country. And actually these two uh, black circles, one uh, was uh, represented UK and the other Germany, which if you remember, these were the next two uh, big areas to be affected in, in the weeks after that. Um, but obviously, you know, there's, there's exceptions uh, to the rule. Like uh, I, believe, I believe this one was uh, Brazil, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we'll, we'll see that in the next slide as well. So then we made a, a tentative prediction um, uh, based on what we had at that early March time point. Um, we made a uh, we made a map for March and April, and 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 this one actually overlays both temperature and uh, specific humidity, even though it just says temperature. But we uh, had overlaid the humidity as well, and we predicted for March and April these would be the areas at highest risk. And the circles are showing you one day uh, death totals, um, which was on April uh, uh, April 9th, just showing death totals from, from, from one day from uh, uh, in April during this time period. And you can see for that one day, um, the highest, if you took 15 of the places with the highest death totals, they all, uh, 14 of them actually were uh, very close to the span. One exception, again, being uh, Brazil. Um, and, uh, and this led us to, to, I mean, to believe that, uh, you know, temperature and humidity should be included in um, epidemiological modeling going forward. Um, and one thing I would just say that uh, this model doesn't seek to explain uh, the cases everywhere around the world, right? So we know that 
you know, this is not what the map of COVID looks like now, or it's not what it looked like actually in April. There is there are cases at that time point, probably all around the world. What we're arguing or what we're hypothesizing is that, let's say the R naught um, for these areas uh, are different than the R naught for these areas. So what that means is uh, the the green areas or the ones with certain temperature or humidity conditions really are set up for uh, higher risk and of, of transmission. Um, if you even if you had a, a doubling, a, a two twofold difference between um, let's say the green areas and the non-green areas, eventually uh, uh, after uh, let, uh, you know let's say we have a doubling time of ten here and a doubling time of twenty here. Um, eventually they, they'll, they'll catch up to each other. Um, in other words, uh, slopes will be different, but you will end up having uh, lots of cases. And we're seeing that um, uh, all over the world. Um, if you look at India right now, they have a lot of cases, but the, the slope of the increase is, has been slow and steady. Um, but I, you know, this is a hypothesis that remains to be seen. And, and I think ultimately uh, this coming fall uh, and winter will, will uh, help answer this question. Uh, of the seasonality, um, and of course, yeah, but there's other factors uh, with the public health interventions. They can uh, definitely uh, impact um, how you can analyze um, analyze this. So at this point, I'm going to end it here, and I'm going to turn it over uh, to Augustine. And um, I don't know if we want to take questions now, or we can do it at the end. So Augustin, you have the ball now, so you'll have to share your screen. Um, Augustin, you there? Augustine, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Can you see, sorry, can you see my screen now? Oh, yeah, and we can hear you. Perfect. Fantastic. So uh, thanks more for this uh, presentation. I, in this part of the presentation, I will uh, talk very briefly about uh, work we are doing for uh, developing warning, early warning systems for COVID-19 based on uh, the prediction of favorable weather and climate conditions. So the motivation comes from what we want to do is to exploit the hypothesis that Mo just presented on the relation between uh, weather and climate uh, uh, conditions and the virulence of uh, the virus for developing early warning systems for COVID-19. Of course, here we are hypothesizing that uh, such early warning systems may help decision making by, for example, prioritizing distribution of medical supplies and probably vaccines in the future. So in uh, the paper that Mo uh, just presented, uh, we produced the very first forecast of such favorable conditions, a forecast which was based on uh, persisting atmospheric conditions from 2019. We, could, uh, we may have as well uh, used the uh, climatology. But the problem with these uh, two simple, simple schemes for forecasting, so persistence and climatology, is that uh, they are problematic if we consider uh, climate change and internal climate variability. And so PNA and MGO. For example, uh, what if uh, 2019 uh, was a La Nina year, whilst uh, 2020 uh, was uh, an El Nino year? So, uh, so th thinking of this, uh, we decided to uh, test a fully coupled dynamical model of the atmosphere, ocean, and land surface as a core of the baseline early warning system. But uh, we're on. But before anything else, we uh, wanted to uh, have a measure of uh, the magnitude of the differences between the observed values and the climatological values. So uh, what we did is uh, to define a given day as favorable for COVID-19 when the mean two meter temperature and specific humidity are within the bounds provided by the, uh, the paper. And we used era five observations to count the number of favorable days within a given month. Uh, for example, uh, January. 
and uh, define a monthly climatology of the number, number of favorable days. For example, in uh, the left-hand side panel, you can see this climatology, and you can see that uh, in the area of Wuhan, uh, there are uh, around 20, 22 uh, uh, favorable days uh, during January, uh, during a typical January. And we know that uh, uh, it was during January that things went uh, explosive in, in uh, Wuhan. Now, when we consider the specific January 2020, and uh, we take the difference between January 2020 and the climatologic January, we see uh, the differences of uh, favorable days per month on the right-hand side panel. And we can see that uh, in the area of Wuhan, we have uh, something like uh, uh, almost five days uh, per month, additional five days per month during this specific January. And as Mo presented just now, uh, five days is uh, kind of the incubation period of uh, of the virus, so maybe it's a small number, but uh, I don't think that is an insignificant numbers. And we have to uh, uh, be considered, at least, at least at this phase, we have to go consider this kind of uh, this modulation uh, of, of the observations uh, when you consider, uh, compare them with uh, climatology. So having this result, uh, we uh, followed, uh, we continue by developing the prototype system. And of course, we have to have a scope. And the first scope that we have here is to stimulate discussions between the health and climate com communities, which will lead to the inclusion of uh, meteorological variables eventually in, a, in epidemiological models. And also, of course, what I was saying before is to provide quasi operational epidemiological forecast to stakeholders. And of course, when we do forecasting, we have to define first what we are going to forecast. And we start with something uh, very simple. We consider the probability for the occurrence of 15 or more days with favorable conditions within a, a 30 day period. At this moment, we are not considering uh, intermittency of favorable days. How, I mean, for example, the uh, 15 days can be in the first part of the month, or we can have uh, days uh, uh, every other day being favorable. And we don't, we don't know exactly what's the impact of uh, this intermittency. So uh, we will eventually. Uh, uh, look at that uh, with on, oh, with the new data that are receive, receiving now, and uh, we uh, the forecast target period is uh, from day 14 to day 43 of the subseasonal forecasting, which is a period of 30 days. Next, uh, so uh, continuing, we have to we had to uh, choose now uh, a weather climate forecasting components, and uh, actually in. There are many uh, subseasonal forecast models available in uh, the SubEx and S2S databases. Although SubEx, the good thing with SubEx is that it provides uh, real-time forecast operationally and still containing the corresponding reforecast databases, which uh, are very useful for uh, uh, calculating bias corrections, calibrations, and uh, forecast skill estimations. So uh, the CFS uh, within the SubEx uh, database, the CFS, NOAA CFS version 2, is the only subseasonal model which updates daily 16 member ensemble forecast. And this is the daily uh, uh, update that uh, we uh, took, you know, uh, attracted my, our intentions. As a measure of comparison, the ECMWF for the moment is updated only twice per week, their uh, subseasonal system, although they're uh, planning to, to do that to start updating a daily too in, in the next couple of years. Uh, so we uh, chose choose a, as a core subseasonal forecast model, uh, the CFS, and that despite having a very uh, short, re relatively short reforecast database from 1999 to 2010. And our observational uh, database uh, was is ERA-5, for which we use for post processing and verification. So an example of a forecast this is the forecast initialized uh, two days ago on the uh, June 20th. It's shown in this uh, figure. The favorable daily mean conditions are defined uh, through these numbers that uh, Mo presented uh, for the specific humidity and uh, uh, two meter temperature. And here we are showing the probability for 15 days or more with favorable conditions between uh, the 4th of July uh, and the uh, 2nd of August, 2020. Of course, the uh, probabilities probability are elevated in the winter hemisphere, which is the southern hemisphere right now. And you can see that there are uh, areas in uh, Argentina and southern Brazil and uh, South Africa and uh, uh, southeastern uh, uh, Australia that uh, these probabilities for favorable conditions for more than 15 days of favorable conditions are uh, pretty high. And we can focus, for example, in, in uh, 
South Africa in Johannesburg. And here consider uh, the probability of favorable conditions for any given day uh, for the whole uh, duration of the forecast from day uh, one to day uh, 43, 44. So uh, here you can see four panels, which uh, four time series, uh, which are uh, showing this forecast initialized at different times. Uh, initialized the, the very the upper panel is initialized on uh, April 1st, the second one on April 9th, and the two last panels are la the, the latest forecast with a few days uh, difference. So I have uh, relocated these panels in order to have uh, verification times on the same uh, y axis. For example, this uh, black line that you see here corresponds to uh, the, the 28th of uh, June for each of these uh, forecasts independently on uh, initialization date. So what we can see is that uh, for uh, Johannesburg, for uh, South Africa, the CFS was forecasting uh, or still forecasts uh, very favorable or probability, very high probability for favorable conditions uh, starting from mid uh, June and continuing at least to, uh, to uh, mid uh, of July. As you can see for this all this uh, this forecast here and uh, eventually if we consider the john hawkins university uh, uh, application which counts uh, uh, deaths and cases we can see that in south africa we have for right now 97,302 uh, cases and you can see the curve on the right uh, lower corner of the, uh, the, the, the graph the application and you can see that right now the uh, south africa is in the exponential uh, uh, phase of development of uh, the, uh, the number of cases basically uh, yesterday there were 97000 cases and uh, 20 days ago they had only like 30 32000 cases so they're really in the exponential uh, increase phase so currently what we are doing is to uh, distribute uh, by email, a weekly forecast bulletin presenting this experimental forecast in the, to researchers, individual re researchers at university agencies and uh, the military. So if you are interested in receiving this weekly forecast, please contact me. And uh, we also started working uh, on the development of a website that would facilitate uh, interactive access uh, to the monitoring and forecast and act of, uh, of, of this uh, forecast, of our forecast. Uh, further down the, the longer vision is to uh, create a, a seamless suit of products with geographical downscaling whenever wherever necessary, which will uh, contain a monitoring part and a forecast part. The monitoring part we consider uh, we're considering uh, to use observational data from era five until day minus five. They are providing uh, on real time uh, days, uh, you know, uh, the up updating up to five days uh, prior to today. And then use a day minus four to zero for uh, use an analysis for the GFS analysis, for example, the, which will, will be bias correcting. And then we go to the forecast uh, part of uh, the, the system with days one to seven uh, taken by uh, forecast from the GFS, days eight to 14 by the ensemble GFS and the CFS. And then finally, for days uh, over 15, uh, use the, the CFS, of course, bias corrected by era five. Now, we, what we are doing also is to use the latest numbers of uh, COVID-19 cases to refine criteria for favorable weather and climate conditions. The bias correction scheme that we're using is quantile mapping and it's proved to be uh, pretty good so far. And uh, we will explore the need for calibration and define measures of forecast skill based on uh, utility metrics after we have the, uh, refined our criteria for these uh, favorable conditions. And, uh, and of course, eventually, uh, we need to uh, increase the ensemble, the number of ensemble members uh, when doing this subseasonal forecast by, uh, and we will do so by using uh, multimodal approaches. And uh, finally, uh, we will try to extend down the road uh, the forecast to uh, seasonal lead times. And that's what all I have today. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just say a, a couple of a, a closing uh, words. Um, so this has moved very quickly, but basically we, we went from zero to where we are in, in about three months um, from the, that date in early March till now. Um,
and uh, so this is work in progress. We have a, you know, um, one paper has been published uh, in these developments that we're working on now. Um, and uh, we are starting to also submit some proposals uh, to uh, further this work. Um, so we wanted to give you um, um, this overview of what we've done today and we'll, we're happy to um, answer any questions and entertain any comments you may have. Great, thanks guys. Um, so like John said in the beginning, we're happy to take questions in text format or if you wanna raise your hand, I'll just unmute you. Oh, people are already raising their hand. I am too slow. Um, I will unmute Santiago Gusto. Uh, okay. <laughs> there you are. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, uh, so I wonder, do you guys consider uh, pollution conditions in the, those places, uh, PM 2.5 and uh, what levels uh, correlated with those uh, meteorological factors? That's it, yeah. Well, you can, uh, you, you want to answer? Uh, sure, I mean, yeah, I think we, we had talked about that um, and uh, I don't think we had any immediate access to, that, access to that data, but I think it is something that we are interested in. And I think, uh, um, Augustine, you, you can comment on, because I know you were, were trying to get uh, a handle on some of that data, right? Yes, we were discussing Fernando, maybe you have uh, more details, but the idea here is that uh, pollution uh, mm -hmm. may affect the rate of or the virulence of uh, I mean, the, right. the infection because it's uh, uh, increasing uh, the sensitivity of uh, the human body. Yeah, 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 Santiago, you're, you're, I think you hit the nail. We That, that is part uh, of uh, one of the proposals that we are planning to, that we're actually planning to submit uh, is to actually incorporate that into, into the system that we're developing. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, that's the next logical thing. Yeah. Great. Right. Okay. So I will unmute Safa Moos. Safa, you're unmuted. Hello. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi. Uh, so thank you for this excellent presentation. Um, I just have one question for uh, Dr. Sajadi and Fernando and Augustine. So, based on many papers that were published, it seems that most of the transmissions of the coronavirus have taken place in uh, closed spaces, so indoors, where it's under air conditioning and the temperature and humidity is controlled by the uh, HVAC systems. So, how do you incorporate that into the results, into your results? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I can start here. So, yeah, it's true. So there, there could be uh, different um, dynamics of transmission indoor versus outdoor. Indoor, you also have more, more confined space uh, that increases the probability of uh, transmission. But I believe that in, in the wintertime uh, that the outdoor, uh, the outdoor humidity and indoor humidity um, are um, similar, uh, even though the, you know the, the temperature is not. Um, I think the humidity conditions uh, do change in the winter time. Uh, but um, but but you're right. I mean that's something that uh, uh, that needs to be. Yeah, I mean I look at it as is is sort of two two separate. Um, yeah, two separate modes of, of transmission outdoor versus indoor, but I think there is a correlation between what's at least with the humidity outdoors and indoors. Yeah. Well, an, an example is, uh, for example, what is going on in the south right now. Uh, they have a very high uh, temperature and humidity. Everybody's in uh, indoors uh, where the air conditioning is dropping uh, the, uh, the re relative uh, humidity and temperature. And basically, if you consider 21 Celsius and recirculating air, of course, 21 Celsius and about 40 to 50 percent of humidity, this gives us uh, a specific humidity around the numbers that uh, we uh, we found as uh, critical. So outdoor temperature can uh, affect the number of people that are you know, confined inside uh, air conditioned uh, environments, both in both summer and uh, in winter, of course. So in that sense, does increasing temperature lead uh, to more infections is that uh, so is that would that be the conclusion 
uh, uh, not directly, indirectly, through uh, people getting into uh, air conditioned. Yeah, more inside, yeah. Uh, like exactly what one of the uh, explanations for the flu, the, the seasonal flu being in winter, is that as the temperature drops, then people are gathered in indoors rather than, uh, you know, the density of uh, indoor uh, uh, population is higher than in summer. I mean, in, in autumn or in spring. Uh, so that, so this would be the opposite, right? Because right now, in like places in the south, like Arizona, uh, Georgia, Texas, Florida, uh, they have they have a rapid surge in number of cases, and these are places that are pretty hot right now because of the summer condition and uh, uh, higher humidity. Yes. So that would be the opposite of the explanation for the flu, right? Uh, no, not really, because uh, because of these high temperatures and humidities, then people are gathered inside uh, air conditioned uh, areas. But we also have to consider that uh, in the south, uh, lockdowns were uh, you know, stopped uh, pretty fast. So there, are, it's not only the environmental conditions and uh, the gathering of people in indoors yeah. or outdoors. It's also this kind of uh, epidemiological decisions that uh, can lead to such increases. Yeah, so, so yeah, the, the one thing I'll add, Safa, is um, that we, I mean, we're really looking at conditions and temperature and humidity that favor transmission, not necessarily the dominant transmission, right? So, I mean, if you have, uh, you know, people gathering in bars and having drinks and hugging each other, uh, regardless of the temperature <laughs> in which that occurs, uh, you're going to have a, a, a significant transmission rate. You know, I think what what our what our work intends to do is to focus on on the temperature and humidity factors that you know all, all other factors being equal would favor transmission. Sure. So I mean, I don't want to uh, hold you guys too long, but so the question, if if uh, you're trying to find the correlation of the factors like from temperature and humidity that uh, favors transmission, then somehow. Uh, you should be able to statistically separate the impact of all other factors, uh, such as, you know, indoor, uh, indoor transmission, such as wearing masks, such as lockdowns and the, the stage of the lockdown, which is, for example, it is just the schools, universities, like all the restaurants, bars. So what's the degree of the lockdown? and um, uh, hygiene, really, you know, how much people pay attention to hygiene. So. Is there something, you know, along the way that you would be including all those other factors so that you would be able to separate specifically the effect of temperature and humidity? Yeah, so what, you know, you know, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you so one quick answer is, you know, one of the um, uh, one of the avenues that we're looking at is uh, incorporating these results into into um, more detailed um, epi models that will actually you know simulate all these factors be able to se separate different signals um and um and there are you know we the the typical um the epi models that we've seen out there and now they're now since COVID 19 there have been a few efforts now trying to incorporate um uh, weather type variables like these um but uh before COVID 19 the 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 literature was pretty stale on, on that front. So hopefully we'll be able to provide some data to parameterize the, the temperature and humidity parameters for those models. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I see Ellen Williams has raised her hand. So I am going to unmute her now. Hi, I have a, uh, am I unmuted now? Yep, you are. Okay, great. I have kind of a general question. This is really exciting and the ability to think about making short to medium term projections is really exciting. But there's also maybe something like simpler you could do that would be of tremendous interest to people who have to be making long term planning decisions right now. And I wonder if you could simply take an average over, say, a few of the past years of temperature, humidity versus place, and then for any given location, provide a generic guidance on what points in the year are likely to be most problematic? Uh, could try to answer this question. Uh, yes, we did that. And uh, it appears that at least in uh, our latitudes, uh, things are going to start getting uh, bad in uh, around November. But then 
how do we define exactly climatology in, uh, under the perspective of a climate change? Uh, are we going to define it the 10 last years or the five last years? And uh, that's why we eventually uh, uh, decided to go full model, but we, we already have uh, you know, this analysis of uh, uh, climatological uh, conditions. I just, I agree that, that uh, there's lots of variables there, but there's some kind of broad general rules of thumb mm -hmm. that I think it'd be really useful for you to quantify and make available. I would imagine that, for instance, the University of Maryland administration, which is making all kinds of hard choices right now, would really like to have this in addition to the, uh, the more exciting uh, Absolutely. Absolutely, and that's why, I mean, we use the, such uh, uh, climatological uh, conditions uh, to uh, put a target of, uh, we try to be ready to start this forecast in October, in October 1st, in order to uh, account for, you know, the uh, things getting worse in November and December. Well, thanks so much. Um, I have a text question I want to just throw in really fast because he's been waiting. Um, this is from Mark Eakin. He says, I see that the forecasting is working well for Johannesburg, but over forecasting South Australia, Adelaide to Melbourne. How would you combine your climate based forecasting with non pharmaceutical interventions such as travel restrictions in Australia? Right. Yeah, so I think, I mean, in, in, or, in order to do something like that, we, we would need uh, to so essentially combine, uh, you know, this information that we've generated with, with, an epi, with an epi modeling tool that would actually be able to simulate all these factors that we're not looking at. Uh, and, and, then, and then come up with, you know, trade-offs and, um, um, and guidance, you know. So I think, uh, you know, partially, partially answering also Alan's question previously, I think we um, I think the, the the you know the quick analysis that we did will serve the purposes of providing sort of sort of a sort of bulk broad type uh, advice advisory um, um, advisory possibilities. Um, and uh, but in order to answer like more more detailed questions like like Mark's, I think we have to you know we have to do some sort of simulation modeling. Okay, so there's also a second part of his question. He says. Should we be watching for outbreaks in Buenos Aires soon? Well, the conditions are uh, favorable, but uh, we have to consider also what are the measures taken in Buenos Aires, right? Uh, right. If they are already in lockdown and uh, uh, such considerations. Yeah. And also the web, I mean, certainly the season's turning, right? So, so they're starting their winter, right? So that's when this is supposed to take off. Well, yeah, I mean, they, they are actually having their most cases that they've had in the last three months, right. um, the last couple of days. So, um, you know, whether it's gonna reach, you know, uh, those kind of proportions or not, but they, they definitely have to keep their peaking certainty right now. Okay, thank you. Um, so I see that Dwight Sestano has his hand up, so he is now unmuted. Hi, uh, uh, thank you. This is very nice talk. Uh, and very interesting too. So I wonder whether you have the uh, the probability uh, as a function of latitude, so that uh, uh, so that we can have you know what is the probability in terms of a tropical region and also the subtropic uh, and high tropic region. Uh, and I believe uh, yes, uh, you should uh, do the uh, what are the pollution. The air quality is important, so that's that. I uh, believe, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, because I used to live in Indonesia and I know, I like, know the uh, big city, mostly in the pollutant city or the uh, the metropolitan city, uh, not only because of dance, but also because of the pollution. It looks like uh, they have uh, effect on it. So thank you. Yes, I guess we are going to create more uh, diagnostics and um, and metrics on the forecasting using the forecasting system. Great. So Santiago has another question. So you are unmuted now, Santiago. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, 
I wonder, can you test the, this approach with past pandemics, with SARS and MERS? I mean, would you think it would work? Is it worth is it worth doing it? Uh, and also, just a quick comment. Somebody mentioned uh, Buenos Aires. Uh, just uh, as an information, the last weekend, the government of the city of Buenos Aires met with the governor of the province surrounding Buenos Aires. And, and they decided to step up the quarantine and social distance protocols because the sharp increase in numbers. Uh, that's this. Yeah, it happened yesterday. So everybody's very everybody's very upset because they have to go back in. Uh, yeah, but they haven't. They actually they haven't triggered an actual quarantine because they realize that the people are so upset and <laughs> and tired of doing this that they didn't want to create unrest. Anyway, so going back to the question, would this work out trying with past pandemics, uh, the same approach? I don't think so. Um, and for the simple reason for MERS, um, the total number of cases was, uh, and for SARS as well, very few, relatively speaking. And the number of uh, regions affected for MERS were, you know, mostly in the Middle East. And it was imported some places like, um, uh, I think Belgium, US, SARS had a little bit more of a reach um, rather, outside of China. It did reach the US, Canada, some places in Europe, but there just wasn't enough uh, cases, I think, to do something like this um, for those two coronaviruses. Okay. Thanks. Great. So we have another text question. This person says, the virus is now all over the world. When will the peak come up according to your model? <laughs> okay. yeah, first thing, that's a good question. I, I would say if, if, if there was, I would just say this, if, if there was no interventions, my, my prediction would have been a, a peak in, in the fall, winter uh, globally. But, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I think, uh, I think we, uh, I think, you know, we, I'll go back to what I said earlier. We, we, we um, what we've done is, uh, is, um, is collect some data, a fairly, a fairly large database that, um, that um, sort of converges around uh, the seasonality hypothesis that we set out in the beginning when we started working on this. Now, to, we don't have a predictive model yet. I mean, we, I mean that's one of the avenues that we'll that we're working on, but there are other people also doing this. So maybe we'll collaborate with a, a group that's a little bit more further along, um, you know that uh, that avenue. Um, and um, so, but I think you know uh, I think I think uh, Mo hit it in the head. You know if you, you know if, if you have no interventions, then you you would see a step up in in the fall winter when the temperatures drop and humidities. Thank you. Um, Safa actually just messaged me and said that he had a comment. Here he is. You are unmuted, Safa. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. So uh, just on the question of when will, so what's the forecast for the future for like a long term future? Um, I've been, you know, I've been following the epidemic since January and I, I think at this, uh, the long-term forecasts are very difficult because the the, the main uh the, the main driver of long-term uh, behavior of the epidemic is um uh, is exactly human decisions mm -hmm. public health policies mm -hmm. and our actions so if you know these mitigation policies the interventions you know improved hygiene universal masks so those kind of policies will determine the real driver it's not really this is not a an autonomous uh natural system that we could predict over long term without uh taking into account the um human system policies and the public health policies and this is something that uh, uh we've been working with fernando for many years on on uh, coupled human natural systems and it's the same exactly same thing so once you have these feedbacks with the human system the policies and the decisions on the human side 
drive the um, drive the behavior and the dynamics in the natural system. And I think this is the same case. So, so for the epidemic, uh, we can predict maybe four weeks out because we know the conditions right now, or maybe five weeks. But anything beyond that, it really depends on uh, how we respond to it. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. I agree, although I have a comment here is that uh, WHO sh should have been ready for all this uh, situation. And actually, I think they were ready. But uh, I don't think that they did exactly what they should have done. Or at least there are many critiques uh, against them. All right. Uh, looks like we are a bit over time. Any other questions? Vlad, uh, Nate, um, Cod, and and this thanks speaker for their great presentation. Well, uh, no, thanks everyone. Maybe uh, I mean one one idea is maybe we can do a maybe we can do a follow up seminar sometime in February or you know thereabouts when winter is uh, uh, blooming and then we'll 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 see where we're at at that stage or or maybe send an update. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, we're all great. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Take care. <laughs> you too. You Bye.